Holler if you hear me, and welcome to this week's edition of Luke Covers, because the Acolyte trailer, the first trailer, is up and out and ready to go for its two-episode premiere event right there in the middle of June, and let's just say the crowd is running mild. I mean, wild. Wild. Because boring visuals, boring-looking characters, boring-sounding characters, and a boring-looking story truly, truly is something that is worthy of the Star Wars saga. Truly, this is something where people still cling with white-knuckle fanaticism to how much terrible the prequels are and how the Disney's trilogy is so much better compared to all of that. You know, they say as they keep on trying to live in denial and absolute denial, but there is no denying how bad, 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 just plain bad that this was. It is the idea of something that was as important as Star Wars was to so many people, as phenomenally significant as it was in the world of pop culture and the world of entertainment, as this being an example of someone's impossible dream going up against every obstacle that was out there in the world of Hollywood, that George Lucas had to go and fight tooth and nail to get this made, that the only other person in the industry of the 70s that thought this was worthwhile at all was the man who was the president of Fox at the time, Alan Ladd Jr. And even then, that was more to do with how Ladd Jr. just wanted to work with George Lucas than really, really believing it. It was a matter of, well, this is his new project. Okay, I'll be behind it. And everything aligned, everything that you out there with your independent creative aspirations has ever thought about, this is something I would want to do. This is my idea. This is the thing I know is a billion dollar concept. Star Wars was that. It went against all those obstacles. It found its way into the pop culture lexicon and overnight became a complete smash hit despite opening in only about 30 something theaters nationwide. And now from there, we go to the world of the Acolyte, where we have another example of a strong, independent woman who is the key to everything. Despite how important she is, she seems to have no real interest or investment in what's going on. Not to mention, we also have, for a series that was so, so, so picked on and yelled at by intersectional narcissists for screaming about how it's so whitewashed and all that. This story is supposed to take place a hundred years uh, in the past, I would say. This would be around even before the prequels, so do not be surprised if uh, to counterweigh any kind of backlash, we wind up getting a Yoda cameo to try to jangle some more card keys in your face, like how the uh, Shoka so made sure that you got to see some Hayden Christensen coming back. And while well, it was nice to see him back, and for all the people making fun of his acting in the prequels, at the very least with how he carried himself in promoting the film, and how he carries himself nowadays with getting back into the franchise through that show and everything else he has done, you go, no, 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 you gotta know that this is a guy who does not deserve that type of, like, strangely personal kind of dislike or whatever, because he's not the type of guy who has any kind of real lashing out at people the way that pretty much everyone else has done. Like the uh, idiot in the cast who said that Star Wars is not really about a black, never been a franchise about just, you know, pure good and pure evil. Um, wrong. Let's go back to the original film, the original trilogy, where in the 70s you had all kinds of dark, serious films, all kinds of harsh realism, all kinds of moral ambiguity or gray areas. And in that time of the 70s, everything that had been building up to in Star Wars came out. Between all the political discourse because of Vietnam, all the talk in the public in general about this subject or that subject, about the, you know, the generational divide and all of that. And then... What came out? This little movie that opened in 30-something theaters where you have hard black hat villains up against hard white hat villains. And guess what? In 1977 dollars, it made 770-something million worldwide. And that's just from the movies. I can only imagine the movie tickets then being toppled with the comic book sales and with the toys and even with the uh, disco music tie-in. I think that people were really, really into the idea of a great traditional story. If anything, what Star Wars was back then, which was a great return to the great serialized Flash Gordon-style space opera, and how that was something that the people were so enchanted by, it completely wiped away all the other kind of movies out there in its wake that were something, something miserable, something, something dark, something, something trying to current day you. 
And now how the tables have turned and Star Wars has been co-opted by the same soul-dead, unimaginative corporate machine that George Lucas was going up against in the studio system of the 70s, where the studio system was nowhere near what it is today, where now every major studio is just another portion of some massive corporate conglomerate. In the 70s, nope, that wasn't the thing. But now... uh, It's almost as if this whole thing by Disney was done as some type of very long-winded revenge on George Lucas and the Star Wars franchise for how Lucas proved everyone wrong and that a story at that time that was going back to something decades old and going to a pure story of heroes and villains, of adventure, of swashbuckling and all of that done in an outer space context did something very, 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 very uh, wrong in the eyes of Hollywood, which is to prove them wrong because they think of themselves as above God. They think of themselves as God made flesh. And well, almost like the whole doomsday device in the movie Dogma, to prove God wrong winds up undoing creation. And well, to have proven the self-appointed gods wrong in Hollywood, they absolutely positively cannot deal with it. They don't take any slights lightly. And especially somebody like Leslie Hedlin and with who is in charge of the Acolyte and with all of the Star Wars projects that have been announced and then canceled to the point of it becoming a meme. I can't help but notice that this project that absolutely excited nobody that absolutely positively had nobody really interesting or creative or talented or qualified or passionate at all. And this series that happens to have been produced by somebody with some shady connections to good old Harvey Weinstein, that gets plowed through. And uh, when we get a description of the show, well, for the first time, Leslie Hedlund is finally brought up to talk about a production involved with her, where she is incessantly mentioning her sexuality. She takes a break from that long enough to tell you that the Acolyte is a combination of Frozen and Kill Bill. Because, yes, Frozen and Kill Bill, those are things very comparable to Star Wars. Those are things very, 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 very comparable to uh, Lucas's vision of this story. Very, very, very comparable to anything at all that involves in this context. Now, if you're involved in a franchise, you are not really allowed to go and do your own thing. If you want to go and do your own creative thing, which seems to be the only people that the Disney company wants to really work with anymore, are the people that are so full of themselves, such egomaniacs, so intellectually pretentious in body and soul, that it's almost as if they're using the Star Wars franchise as some type of art therapy where their own personal hangups in one direction or another are being their fuel for lashing out at the established audience that just wants to be entertained, while they're the type of filmmakers who wish that they could have been back in the early 70s Hollywood, wherever who it was a competition to see who could be the most joyless, really, when you look at it. And then you look at a guy like Lucas, and I can imagine them looking at him with his whole dad bod and his beard and his mannerisms. They would use him as the front group for all of their own neuroses about their own daddy issues and using it till, using that as an excuse to just lash out in a Star Wars production. Because that's truly the proper place to deal with your own personal anguish is to go and have a billion dollar franchise being trusted to you in this way. And well, Hedlund, let's just say she doesn't really have much experience with doing anything in a quote unquote creative capacity that isn't about herself. The woman who whom was an ex Harvey Weinstein assistant who then after she was done being his assistant and happily taking pictures with him over and over and over at one event or another, Google image search Harvey Weinstein, Leslie Hedlund, and you see those horrors for yourself. And there she was all happy go lucky with this man. And then only after the fact does she go and write a quote unquote play that's about a woman who was the assistant of a man who, you know, did some uh, impure things with his women and got away with it. But of course, not doing it directly. You only, you know, fictionalize it in a way where even Ray Charles with a blindfold could see what you were doing, all right? You're about as transparent in who you were talking about as that novel, The Devil Wears Prada, and the movie adaptation was really talking about the big uh, fashion lady, Anna Wintour, and the writer there having to have been her ex-assistant. But that is something that requires a little bit of extensive knowledge and a little bit of perception. 
And this trailer opens with people telling them that their eyes deceive them. Well, for all the talk about how looks can be deceiving, in this situation, with the look of this trailer, I see a very boring, boring show whose only trick is to pander to, pathetically, the farthest of far left talking points, and also do what it can to try and do further faux intellectualizing of garbage concepts that do not belong in this franchise they are going to try and develop. And if you thought that the whole thing with Rey in The Last Jedi and the real relations about her parents not being important was stupid, well, look at this show and you think the big line you get from this trailer is uh, good or bad, that there is only power that matters. Because to people like Leslie Headland and to the people in charge of Lucasfilm, all that matters to them is that they continue to have more power. And will they want to care about who wields it? Yes, so long as they get to wield it over people that they can't stand. And that's not my opinion. I know I'm right. So I want to thank you for watching. Subscribe so my channel will reach 10,000 subscribers this year. Don't forget to become a channel member today. Membership start at $2.99. And don't forget to shop my art store at the second link below, where uh, besides my artwork that's there for sale, there's also sketchbooks and commissions available. You can also donate my store. Donations are the first thing you see. And if you want to buy or commission me from outside of America, well, when you donate, that money goes directly to me. So uh, if you want to buy my work, donate uh, whatever is the amount you want, plus the $25 US for the international shipping handling fee. So felines, slam it, lick it, suck it, and see you, Space Cowboy.